Hello there, I'm Pat Armitstead. In 2001, I declared myself to be the world's first joyologist and have since then been delivering a range of programs designed to lift spirits and um, support humanity as we go through this great shift in consciousness. So look forward to sharing some of the um, turmoil and some of the joy <laughs> that, that's come on that on along that process. Thank you. Now welcome to yet another exciting episode of the online prosperity show. And today I've brought you the world's first geologist, Pet um, Amistad. Pet, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm really well, thank you. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Nice to chat again. <clears throat> Absolutely. Now, obviously, uh, viewers, you would understand that every time we bring you experts in their own realm um, so that they can help you perv your way um, to a business that's profitable and enjoyable. Now, we're going to be hearing Pat's story, but, um, you know, from where she started and up until right now where she has won numerous awards and she is now um, the world's first geologist, which she first proclaimed back in 2001. And up until now, she's managed to uh, co-author a couple of books and she's hosting her own radio and TV program and building, uh, and, 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 um, building a world-class art gallery, okay? She's also um, award-winning advertising uh, personnel and she's also gotten seven speaking awards and she's uh, toured around the world with uh, the likes of Patch Adams, um, who also now happens to be the patron of her TV show, um, The Lighter Channel. Now, I could go on and on and on about Pet's accolades, but her work really is to help people find joy when it appears to um, have none. And also, when you're working in a business, sometimes it's not always, um, you know, the straight path to success. So that's the reason why you need the geologist to actually come and help you be, do, and have a happier existence. Now, Pat, I could go on and on about your accolades. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and how, you know, the title geology mm -hmm. uh, stuck. Yes. <clears throat> in, in the very beginning, I, I wanted to be an artist, but my mother told me to get a proper job. And so it was that off I went nursing and I nursed for 16 years left nursing and by default ended up with my own small ad agency uh, producing commercials and um, freelancing for the news, um, covering news stories, uh, working for 20, 20, 60 minutes. Um, after that, after doing that for 11 years, ended up relocating to New Zealand and um, a series of losses over a four year period uh, really brought me to my knees. Uh, my doctor at the time wanted to medicate me and I said to her, actually, I don't want to be medicated. Help me deal with my grief. And she was not the poorest person to help me. And I went looking for another way. And um, I went to a grieving seminar. And on that same night, I talked to a magician in South Australia for half an hour on the phone. And it was in the middle of that phone call that there was this aha moment and um, a message came to me, oh my God, we've got radiology, pathology, hematology, but no joyology. I'm going to be a joyologist. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do with that. It was like, okay, that's a wonderful message, but <laughs> uh, where do I take this? And, you know, sometimes we can uh, scrabble looking for solutions or we can get clever. And so I decided to do two pilot programs, um, one a three month program and the other a 12 month. And that really gave me time to um, look at the knowledge I had, how I was going to harness it all and bring it forward and create some substance for the business. Um, and by 2004, I'd done that. Um, created sufficient IP, developed a brand, and um, off I went. So I delivered into programs, into the health sector and into business. Um, received very well in the beginning in the health sector, 
less readily in the business sector. In the beginning, people would say to me, oh, look, Pat, I'm sure you're a very nice lady, but we actually have fun Friday after work. This is serious business here. But in 2006, I worked with uh, a big law firm in New Zealand, Kensington Swan, and they were having a five-year client intimacy program and invited me to be part of that project. And, and that's when things just really cemented for me. I just saw the wisdom <laughs> uh, that this incredibly serious business had in um, wanting to have its staff engage in a more intimate way with each other and then learn to engage at a deeper level with their clients. Um, and, you know, the work they did in that period enabled them to be the first law firm to be invited um, into Abu Dhabi. Uh, and, and the way was paved for them um, to do that by merit of who they were being. So these lawyers still maintained their pristine persona, but they had become very deeply connected to themselves and, and who they were as individuals. Um, and stopped using money <laughs> as a tool to get custom and started really relating and relating very deeply. So for me, the word intimacy has um, grown since that period. I have a vision for 2020 that we'll be having an intimacy revolution and it's already begun. Um, where does humour fit into that? Um, you can't engage you can't engage in humour if you don't have a high level of trust. People won't, <laughs> won't go there if there's not that trusting relationship. So, you know, being able to develop those relationships within, within the individuals but also in the workplace um, that creates the rapport, the repartee, um, when people need to really be having a deeper conversation, and especially now in Australia, there are, you might be aware, 3,000 suicides a year. That's one every couple of hours. Um, you know, we've got some serious concerns. One in four are medicated for depression or anxiety. Um, so every time we look around at who we're with, um, you know, we're in the company of those people. And, um, you know, we're really being called now, I believe, to step into that space and um, learn to be a real contribution. Absolutely. I love that aspect of contribution because I suppose as entrepreneurs and as humans, we're here to live, we're here to learn, and we're here to contribute. Now, you've lived, you know, all these things and all the experiences that you've had from the corporate uh, lifestyle to the part when, you know, your family members actually told you to get a better job and, um, you know, you've done your part in learning how to become who you've become now and now you're contributing to everybody else so that they have a happier existence i'm going to take you back a little bit there pat because you did mention something that a lot of people go through um when they start um you know showcasing their faces on facebook live and um you know putting up a few uh motivational posts there and they are sort of diving into the whole entrepreneurial journey and then their family just puts them down with a few words that are like get a real job or when you're done with the whole charade um you know just remember bills need to be paid um that brings back a lot of people tell us walk us through um how you fought that up until now you can stand back and actually Talk to people and, and tell your story. Yeah, I really see myself now and can own it now. I was probably not as confident in the beginning. Um, in this role, I've been a pioneer. Um, the, way, the way was not made. Um, so there was a very long period of time. Uh, the first two or three years, I worked part-time and developed the business, developed the IP. In the face of not a lot of agreement, there were, you know, friends, colleagues who were saying, oh, this is beautiful. Um, but the workplace was not ready. But by 2006, it was. Um, and for me, I should mention along that pathway, if you're going to step out, be a pioneer, stick with something that you feel really strongly about, 
then you need really strong support. You need to really be clear on your values and be able to live them absolutely. You need to shore up your boundaries because you're, you're going to meet the naysayers. Um, and, you know, I, I knew of a man by the name of Mike Hutchison who was the MD of Saatchi and Saatchi. And I thought, oh, look, he's such a genial man. I would love him to be my mentor. So sometimes um, ideas can come. And I got a little bottle of Dettol came in the mail. Um, and when it arrived, I thought, oh, perfect thing for me to be asking Mike to be my mentor. So I took that little bottle. I took a makeup sponge, a Band-Aid, and two cotton buds, wrapped it up in a little gift, and gifted it to Mike when I met him. And as you can imagine, he took it out and he's like, what's this, Pat? <laughs> and I said, well, Mike, I'm not here to sponge off you, but I do have the germ of an idea. It's got a couple of applications and I don't want it to be a Band-Aid job. And in that moment, and, and I said to him then, um, these are my ideas around building this new thing called joyology. Will you be my mentor and will you help me source funding? And he said, yes and yes. And he's my friend through to now. Um, you know, we've got to have courage. I was terrified <laughs> to go into that man's office way back then, fairly unresourced, new kid on the block. Um, crazy idea in many people's minds but he understood he said to me um they told disney he'd never make any money making people laugh wow wow yes mm -hmm. and now we've got mickey mouse and uh donald duck and even my little girl knows um all of that that's a remarkable story and definitely we don't really want to sponge off of you there pat because <laughs> in as much as everything else comes along um you are just unraveling all this information that just begs me to ask um once you started going on on this journey and everybody was doubting you about this whole joyology and it's something that they'd never heard of you were probably like the uh, wright brothers telling everybody else that we're going to be flying um, you know, from and, and not yes. the distance, um, you know, um, of, of between places and you're telling people we're actually going to work, make the world smile and transform people through, yes. you know, the, the, the tool of humor. Now, as people were not believing you, um, some people start suffering from, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome, um, you know, that, that, that whole, I'm not good enough or just because i'm not getting the response that i'm anticipating then they start sort of cocooning themselves in a shell would you say during that time you did fake it to make it or you just went in and then it, it developed on its own there would be an element of that um in 2004 i toured with patch adams across europe and in my preparation for that uh when i was talking to patch uh, on the phone, he said, don't come because of me, Pat. Come because you want to find and spend your clown self. Come because you want to experience the disparity between rich and poor. Come because you want to make at least one Russian friend. And I said, oh, should I go to clown school? And he said, well, you can if you like, but I suggest you go with the intention of failing because I don't want a polished clown. I want someone who can walk into any environment and make something happen. And I was already very well equipped for that with my nursing history. So I did do clown school. I studied acting. I studied storytelling, many programs. Uh, and when I returned from, from that tour, um, 16 days um, across Russia, um, I was just so affirmed in my purpose. Um, there was just so much drawn in from like my nursing history, uh, life experiences, um, all these, this time with Patch and taking on his wisdom. And, you know, his, his clowning is about being a compassionate clown. And it's not about being silly, although he, you know, wears the costume all the time. Um, 
it, it's more about finding and expressing your inner child. And for me, it's about really polishing what it means to be good humoured. And I think to be good humoured is to be appropriately responsive or not. And you need a really, really good listening to be able to discern the difference. Patch's mother was a, a diabetic and had one leg removed as a result of very, very poor circulation. And Patch was there when she woke up from the surgery and he leaned in and he bellowed in his mother's ear, there, Ma, now you know what it's like to have one foot in the grave. So not everyone could say that in Absolutely. that moment, all right? Absolutely. It's inappropriate from a lot of areas. So only Patch could say that to his mother. So a lot of my work has been about showing people how to use humour and be good humoured in context. Absolutely. People don't understand humour. So, you know, my, my work is, I presented at Auckland University for 10 years, a stress, humour and health program, um, full seats all the time. Um, and, you know, just expanding people's understanding of our capacity for humour and understanding different humour styles and then about integrating it so it suits your personality. So, yes, coming back to your question, in those early days, um, up until the tour with Patch, um, I was practising, you know, and I know some of my, <laughs> I cringe at some of my earlier efforts, but I didn't stop. And the interesting thing, when I went on that tour with Patch, uh, it was $10,000 plus airfares, and the people who supported me to go were all the groups, Chronic Fatigue, Fibromyalgia, Arthritis Foundation, um, Cancer Society. Right. I had presented to all of those groups, supporting right. them to manage their pain. And I would come home every day and there would be a bunch of mail uh, with $5 or $10 from all these pensioners. Wow. One lady sponsored me $270 a week for 10 weeks. That's so, you know, when we, when we can show up and are assured and in our certainty, those who recognise what it is that we're doing um, will step forward. And, and, and really that was the unfolding. I, I needed to go through that period um, and it really cemented, you know, I just polished, refined, polished, refined. Um, and 2006... Boom. That's where, when things really, really started to happen. Um, and I was doing, then doing 50 or 60 keynotes a year. Absolutely. I was <laughs> Absolutely beautiful there. Now, Pat, I mean, obviously, in, in all that uh, movement that you've done, you have now become an authority um, on joy as a transformational tool, humor, engagement and well-being and, you know, authentic leadership, um, you know, positive psychology and actual storytelling. Now, you, you know, you've gotten us roped into your story right now and everybody's just waiting uh, on to your last words and really um, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Now, from what I'm gathering in, in, in your journey here, Pat, you've enlisted quite a lot of help um, from professionals and from people that you knew um, had the capacity to help you get to uh, where you want to reach. So mentors and coaches have been a part of um, your journey there and also well wishes that knew that you were standing for something and wanted to help you along the journey. Now, the entrepreneur for today wants to do it all by themselves just so that they um, have the badge of honor that I'm self-made. How important is it actually to uh, swallow your pride and actually ask for help? I think it's really important. The, um, these days, you know, I've been Miss Independent all my life. Left, left school at 16, off to work and um, working through all of these years. Um, and that's fine. <laughs> um, however, you know, the... Um, 
what we can do when we collaborate is a totally different story. So to have people come together either in a mastermind situation or to work collaboratively, this um, last book that I've created, Get Known, Be Seen, um, 14 authors came together. We had an expo. Um, we attracted quite a large audience. From there, we thought, oh, we could write a book. And so we've now written the book about how we each came into our authoring. And everyone's story is quite different. And it's not the, I guess, traditional story of, you know, set out the template and do it this way. It's more about my first book. <laughs> um, it came about as a result of a relationship breakup. Um, and I got a speaking engagement and I didn't have a book at that time. And it's like, well, I've got six weeks, I'm gonna have a book. <laughs> and so I created it in six weeks. And I had the first 100 copies sponsored um, by a business that I'd done some work for. So, you know, the, it's about forging those connections with like-minded people. And it doesn't just happen in one encounter. You know, the, uh, I said to you before the show, I'm a bit of a shameless self-promoter. When I began, I committed, I am going to be published every month, not write a book every month but I'm going to be in a magazine, on the radio, on television every month. And I've also been sending what I call glad mail. Um, and I have sent, it would be well over 10,000 pieces of glad mail. This is personalised mail, three pieces a day, um, honouring, celebrating, congratulating. I give out three pieces when I do a keynote. I give it out when I do a workshop. I give it out in the supermarket. <laughs> Uh, if I see somebody um, and you know the I have people ring me I had a person ring me the other day from 2001 a conference I presented at then and wow. she said I still got that bucket and spade you gave me <laughs> so you know we've got to people remember how you make them feel absolutely So when we can touch people's hearts and still show the wisdom there's a, a Buddhist saying that a bird needs two wings. So one is for wisdom and one is for compassion. And I think that kind of fits very well for where I am now. I've got lots of business acumen. I've developed lots of skills and lots in the toolkit. Um, but at my heart is my understanding of grief. And I believe grief is responsible for a lot of the depression that we see. Um, people don't know how to grieve and, and so they suppress it. Um, and the, and humor, you know, my capacity to be good humored, I think I was born with it. Um, and now I've really evolved it. Um, and I'm not a comedian, so I don't, I mean, I'll find jokes and use jokes but my um, good natured self is about telling story relative to the audience. Um, so there's a huge, I've got all these like drawers up here in my head, <laughs> different stories um, that can be pulled out, which lets me be very, very responsive to my audience. Absolutely. Especially <laughs> absolutely i've been just randomly asking you questions here and you've been giving us in-depth answers for each answer i think it's like a whole book that can be written out of all the things that you're putting out there i really appreciate I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff all right so you you you've uh consolidated the money you grown you've started geology um you've got people supporting you left right and center people are accepting you as who you are you've grown but along the way there has been certain episodes where i think you had to be careful um who you spend your time with um you had to be careful who you associated yourself with and you did mention that a lot of people do not know how to grieve um because maybe it's just the people that they're hanging around them are causing them to be uh, depressed or it's the environment which they're in um, this show mainly is about entrepreneurs and you could have people that are watching this um, show that are not, you know, um, you know, clear about 
um, how to be selective about the people they spend time with or the environments they spend, um, you know, their times in. Is that critical to any sort of success? And, and as you have <laughs> gone through your journey, um, do you have yet other stories that you can sw- segue into this, uh, this question here, Pat? Yeah, look, even today, I had an inquiry today. I had been introduced to somebody and this person, we engaged in conversation and I won't go too deeply. Absolutely. Um, however, clearly she had done no research, found out nothing about me and about my history. And, and I said to her, look, I don't think you know who you're talking to. So what? that's a bit arrogant maybe in some people's eyes. But we've got to own the space, you know, yeah. when we've reached a certain point, we've done the work, we've done our 10,000 hours yes, uh, and we've got to claim it. So um, my clown persona when I toured with Patch Adams was Doubting Thomas because right. my life has been plagued by doubt and all the certificates and all the other things that I've gotten done have been... Um, yet another um, mark in the sand about claiming my space. But they were all in the physical and we can't really claim it until we go within. So we need to be, you know, another certificate, another award. (laughs) Um, It's not going to, you know, it's great for a day, a week, and a month even. but it's not going to be sustaining in the long term. So, you know, developing, I know that I'm here. Uh, my top three values are love, freedom, and spiritual intimacy. And I freely share that now in a corporate environment. Are they a bit shocked sometimes? Yes. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't deter me. And <laughs> I, I, know, I, say to, <laughs> I say to them, I have this elephant that I use and I put the elephant, I say that and you can kind of feel people, not everyone, but some will tense up a bit. And so I just put the elephant on the table and I said, I've just placed in this room an elephant. We're not going to talk about it right now, but we're going to come back to it. And somewhere towards the end of the program, we're going to come back into that because by then they're going to get me. Absolutely. I I love the way you use imagery and everything that you do. Uh, First of all, the present that you gave to Pat, the the bottle of dental, and now you've got an elephant in the room that actually needs to be addressed. (laughs) We do have quite a lot to learn from you right there, uh, Pat. And and it's just brilliant, um, you know, listening to you unfold all these stories, um, you know, for 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 our audience here and i really appreciate that now i've got one last question for you you did mention in the last uh, segment there where you talked about um your character was thomas the train and uh, no, no, no 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 doubting thomas not doubting thomas, the train. thomas. <laughs> <laughs> oh you talked about listening and clearly i wasn't listening but i got thomas <laughs> right didn't i all right thomas is- absolutely right so um that being uh, the case, you know, uh, the doubting Thomas uh, beat there. Um, you had to show up as a character and being an entrepreneur and being a dad, being a mother is a role we have to step into every single day of our lives. I think you would have seen my little girl a little bit earlier on. Um, and, and I was in my dad role at that moment. And then I stepped into my work role now, and now I'm in the friend role and everybody else has to do that. And, um, these, all these hats we've got to put on and, um, all these ways that we've got to present ourselves. You've dealt with all walks of life, corporates, um, entrepreneurs, clowns, and people that are walking in their shop or in their day-to-day lives, um, you know, every single time. But one thing that I've always, I've just been fixated on throughout this whole show is how you present yourself. I like your hair. I love the way you dress. And um, I just love everything about your presentation today. So thank you for making the effort. Does it matter 
for an entrepreneur or for people um, that are going to be going into business, I mean, like it or not, people judge you based by the way you are dressed. Is it important to dress the part? I think so. Uh, but it's got to match. You know, when I'm delivering a keynote presentation, I have this amazing orange hat. Um, uh, and it, it's part of my stage presence. Right. But at a point during the presentation, I'll take it off. And I'll step forward and I'll say, I just want to talk rawly and openly to you now. So you open yourself right. up. So, you know, so being able to own a distinctive look right. that you create for yourself. Mostly when I'm presenting, I wear orange and black. I love the monarch butterfly. When all of that chaos happened back at the turn of the century, I lost the pigment out of my skin in a butterfly shape on my chest. In the movie Patch Adams, when his girlfriend has been shot, he goes and looks out over where he's going to build Gesundheit and a monarch butterfly lands on the briefcase and then comes up and lands on his chest. So when I looked in the mirror this day, this is long before I talked to Patch uh, and saw this image and then about 18 months pass and um, I'm talking to Patch and I'm touring with Patch Adams and it's like there's... Um, there's something else going on on the planet. And when we get, um, I'm going to uh, develop our deeply intuitive self is probably the best expression. Great. There's a knowing. I was meant to meet Patch Adams. I was meant to endure all of those difficult times. I was meant to find a way. Wow. And somehow or other with my own will, <laughs> and resolve um and it probably dates right back to the very first man i ever bed bathed he had a crane had fallen on him he had 35 broken bones and first of all they said he's not going to make it right. then they said he'll probably die on the operating table then they said he'll probably be a vegetable then they said he'll never walk again and i looked after that man for three years, he was in hospital, the whole period of my general nurse training. And he walked on two sticks to my graduation ceremony and stood wow. up the back. And when it was finished, he came forward and he had this big scroll and he peeled it open and he started reading off all the tricks and pranks that I had done to him. And I'd spent a lot of time in matron's office in trouble for my naughtiness. When he was finished, he turned to me and he said, you don't know what you did. Wow. So my inner capacity for good humour, melded with compassion, mostly being appropriate, but sometimes inappropriate. <laughs> um, and that's okay because that's what breaks the pattern. You know, inappropriate humour is what, you know, we go, oh, what, what did she say? Um, that's what shifts us. You know, my mentor used to say, humour yanks us out into the bushes, Pat. <laughs> yanks us off the path. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff. Now, Pat, I mean, obviously, um, we could have people watching this right now and then they are really really interested to know more about your story um and and find out how they can basically work with you so they can um have or you can transfer some of this joy that you now possess even in the midst of everything else that's going on in and around your life how what's the best way that people can get a hold of you uh well my current website i'm just transitioning across to an australian website so joyology.co.nz is um, the site and um, all the details are there. If anyone would like to um, connect, be in touch, email me, phone. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, obviously, thank you so much. As you would notice, and thank you so much for tuning into the show right now. If you're watching this uh, part of the, the show, Pat has seriously dropped a lot of nuggets that uh, we didn't anticipate in this show. And as you can understand, since 2001, she's de delivered over 600 keynotes 
at conferences and she has worked um, in-house with leaders and their teams to actually develop high trust uh, environments and building resilience, lifting morale, uh, positive psychology um, in and around all these other workplaces. And you can see that she's going to continue inspiring hope and actually liberating uh, compassion and invoking joy all her life through. I can't thank you enough, Pat, um, for using you know this strength-based approach and all these principles that you left with us um, uh, from elite performance, all this conversational intelligence, and just your own unique capacity to see good and find meaning in a purpose where things just really seemed utterly hopeless. This has been fantastic. And I think it's probably one of our best episodes. If you're watching this right now, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Now, Pat, how can I ever thank you? <laughs> Let's have a coffee one day. <laughs> Absolutely. You got that. You got that. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk again. Great stuff.